It's World UFO Day, Tony. You believe aliens exist? It's Tony Kornheiser. Well, if they don't, then who probed me, huh? Yeah, who? I don't want to know the answer to that. You know, it's yeah, better you know to what, be Mike? UFO Day than UFC Day, I think. Yeah, that's a good line. I actually believe in aliens. I believe every frame of Close Encounters of the Third Time. I believe it to this day, 40 years later. I believe that's possible. I do. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Scotty Scheffler wins again, Max Scherzer returns, and Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark meet again. But we begin today with the two magic words in playoff sports, Game 7. And not only is tonight's hockey game in Florida Game 7, it is the Game 7. The winner will take home the Stanley Cup. It's Florida, which has won the first three games of the series in a row against Edmonton, which has won the last three games in a row. Wilbon, does the Oilers' momentum matter for Game 7? Well, Tony, it may matter to start Game 7. I mean, but you know what happens in any game, and, and, and Game 7s are no different in this regard, in one regard. You get in and somebody takes a stupid penalty, and you got to kill a power play, you know, for two minutes, four or five minutes into the game. Guess what? Your, the momentum in that game is now a different momentum. The other team, whoever the other team is, can have that momentum. So I don't know. I, I think that Edmonton will start with that swarm we've seen early in games, and they score the first goal, and they've gone on when they do that to win. But yes, you get a penalty early, you get a deflected goal early, mm. you get a turnover early, and all of a sudden Florida playing at home can get back on its toes instead of its heels which it has been playing on for the last three games and probably a period. So I don't know how long it lasts, but I would think it's reasonable, particularly with Bobrovsky under siege in the net in Florida. I would think it's reasonable to think that, that, that the Edmonton Oilers begin this game with momentum. I think that the game will come down to one thing. Can Bobrovsky reestablish who he was in the first two home games in Florida? He was a brick wall. He allowed one goal. He stopped 50 of 51 Edmonton shots, and then he turned the other way. I think it's pretty simple. I think if he's great, Florida wins. Their record throughout the playoffs so far, when he allows no more than three goals, is 15-2. and two. But you mentioned home ice. Home ice, surprisingly, doesn't mean anything in Game 7s recently. The last three Stanley Cups that went to a Game 7, the visiting team won. If you add in basketball and baseball, the last three game sevens of consequence, the last six rather, have been won by road teams. I can't explain that personally, Mike, yeah. but I think you have to take it into consideration sure. that road teams seem to win these things. It's counterintuitive, if nothing else. You know, you would go the other way if you said, okay, how many of these have the home team won? And it seems to matter less, and it seems to matter even less in the NHL, the Stanley Cup playoffs, strangely yeah. enough. So, yeah. you know, can't wait. I can't, can't wait to watch this tonight. Let's move to golf, where Scotty Scheffler won for the sixth time this season. Protesters briefly disrupted things on 18 of the Travelers, where Tom Kim eventually sank a birdie putt to force a sudden death playoff. But Scheffler won the extra hole with a par. He's now won four signature events, the Players and the Masters. Tom, what are we seeing here? I think we're seeing something that we haven't seen in 60 years. He has six victories before July 1st, and you mentioned them. These are big events, particularly the players and the masters. And then signature things are, you know, are big deals on the tour. He's the first guy since Arnold Palmer to win six events before July 1st since Palmer in 1962, Mike. Jack Nicklaus never did it. Tiger Woods never did it. Am I saying that Scheffler's better than them? Of course I'm not saying that. But I think we're talking about a trajectory here that you can put his name with them. Now, you can't do it for one year, and you can't do it for two years. You have no. to do it for four or five years. Got to be a lot of wins. Got to be a lot of majors because people get hot. Nick Price in 1994, I believe, won two majors. DJ Singh in 2004 won nine tournaments and a major. Played every week. Rory won four <laughs> majors in three years. Jordan Spieth won four ma three majors in three years. And Kepka's got five, but he doesn't win anything else. I, I think to get involved in a conversation where you mention Tiger and Nicholas, you have to win over a prolonged, extended period of time, not just regular tournaments, but majors as well. 
Well, six is the number. The before July one is phony junk because the schedule's been manipulated for television. So before, when I hear before July one, I want to call up somebody at any network and say, shut up. Don't be an idiot. OK, because now they've front loaded the I front end it. of the schedule, the start of the schedule, and they don't want to go against the NFL. So golf essentially stops in about three weeks. So enough with the July one, because this number is not better. The number that matters than Tiger and the other guys you mentioned who did that thing over a season. What happens in the season matters. That's yeah. all. Now, what we're seeing from Scotty Scheffler is a confined greatness right now. It's just right now. It's not prolonged. It's not big picture. Not yet. Maybe he'll get not there. Yet. Maybe he won't. But I agree with you. You got to sustain yeah. this. And we don't know if it, Jordan right. Spieth, everybody wanted to pronounce somebody for a while. Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth. You got to do it for a while. Let's see if she, Tony, That's, it looks I, like Shaggler has the goods to do it. Yeah. And he dusted, he dusted Kim in the first hole of the playoffs. And I like him. He's appealing. I like him too. He's gregarious. I like him a lot, except yes. for this one thing. He's the slowest player I've ever seen. He's like, slow, at, slow. like they say in Caddyshack, yeah. while we're young, huh? I mean, he stands over a shot for a minute. He's very young. For a minute. 22. Let's move on. The WNBA had a moment yesterday with their two shining rookies, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. Reese's Chicago Sky made up a 15-point deficit in the second half and beat Clark's fever in a tense, exciting game all the way to the buzzer. Reese had her best pro game, 25 points and 16 rebounds. That's her eighth consecutive double-double. Clark had a good game, too, 17 points and a franchise record, 13 assists. Wilbon, is this rivalry becoming what the league hoped it would be? I think so, Tony. It looks like it. And these things, too, have to be sustained. These rivalries have to be sustained if it's what a league wants. And obviously, for a lot of reasons, some of us will go to Bird and Magic because they came in at the same time, rookies at the same time, had played in college. People thought there was oh, they could be really good, but greatness came and greatness against each other really fueled it and changed a league, redefined a league. And so I, that's a lot to put on, on, on Reese and Clark, and I won't do that, but it's exciting to watch. And what I found most exciting is that each one of them has gotten so much better since their debut, respectively. So much better. Angel Reese is so much more assertive and authoritative in the lane. And she is a dominant player the last few games in the lane. And Caitlin Clark, with the, she should have had like 18 assists yesterday. So the That's two right. of them are bringing That's it right. along. Their teams aren't great yet. It's going to take some time. But who knows? Maybe by the end of the year. Maybe they'll both make the playoffs. No. That, that, well, that's my point. I'm going to quibble a little bit here. Because if, they, if it's a good rivalry now, it's not an important rivalry because teams stink. Because they're eighth and ninth in the standings yeah, in a 12 better. team league. Well, yeah. yeah, they're getting better, but they couldn't catch New York or Las Vegas or no, Connecticut. Not or this year. So they, no, they can't. Not, right. this year. not this year. Not this year. No. Not this year. They have history. They had two wonderful NCAA tournament games. This year, Clark beat Reese in a round of eight game, but Reese had the big one. Because Reese won the national championship and then had that signature gesture, put a ring on her own finger and stuck it in Clark's face. I think this is going to be around for a while, and I think that's good. I think Clark is drawing all the crowds in the league. But if you watch the league, a lot of people will stay with it without Clark, without Reese, because they're going to like the product. Let's take a break. Coming up, how should players approach tonight's Game 7? We will ask P.K. Subban. We'll also ask him what an Oilers win would mean for Canada. We stand on guard for the... Can you, you do, do the that whole well. anthem? Can you do the whole thing? Can you do it? I can't. Can you? No, I can't. Can I you? I think I could. I think I'm, I might we'll be start. able to. We'll go. We'll oh, go. Oh, Canada. Do it by July 1st. Our home and native land. Let's get back into tonight's Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final with our great friend, ESPN hockey analyst, P.K. Subban. P.K., you have played in Game 7s. So this is a general question for somebody who's been in this. As a player... Do you approach Game 7 any differently than an earlier game in that series? Well, I'm going to tell you a quick story. In 2016, when I was with the Nashville Predators, I, I was at Kobe Bryant's last game in Boston. Got to meet him after the game and was able to get his number, and we texted that whole season. 
We ended up getting to the Stanley Cup final, and I texted him the night before the final started. I said, Kobe, you know, what do I need to do? It's my first Stanley Cup final. And he goes, what do you always do? I said, well, I go to dinner the night before, I have a glass of wine, eat dinner, you know, da 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 And he goes, don't change a thing. So the same thing goes for the Edmonton Oilers and for the Florida Panthers. you got to stay as close to your routine as humanly possible. Don't get out of your routine. Stay in your comfort zone. PK, I was fascinated by your observation over the last couple of days that Bobrovsky looked tired to you. And I wonder, since then, I know you're hearing all kinds of stuff and having all kinds of conversations. What is he doing to sort of rest up if you can do that kind of thing between a game six and game seven? And do you see him looking any more energetic going into the game seven? Because he better be. Well, I was always a guy that I needed time away from the rink. I needed time away from the game. I needed to get my mind off of hockey. And I think that's exactly what the doctor ordered for Sergei Bobrovsky. For the past two months, he's been unbelievable. He's been playing at such a high level. I'm sure he's mentally and a little bit physically exhausted. And sometimes you just need a reset. A reset for one game, though, Tony. One game, Wilbon. And I'm going to bet on Sergei Bobrovsky. Two Vesna trophies. This guy's been unbelievable all season. He's been great this postseason. But just to get some time away from the, the rink, you know, go on the beach. You know, you have that luxury in Florida. Go jump in the water, hang out with your family. Just get your mind off of hockey. I think that's exactly what the doctor ordered for him. All right, on the other side, of course, we're all fascinated by what we will or maybe not get from Connor McDavid. After those back-to-back four-point games, he had sort of nothing in game six. Do we need to see some explosion out of Connor McDavid, PK, or is that not necessary for Edmonton to win? Well, it's, it's all about trust. And I trust that Connor McDavid, with the ability that he has, I trust him with his skill set. He knows when his team needs a big play. He knows when they need a big goal. But what I've seen from him over the course of the playoffs that's extremely valuable – especially in his position as a captain and a leader, is his leadership qualities of deferring to his teammates, allowing his teammates to also play and get involved, knowing when to turn it up and when to turn the nozzle down. And I think for Game 7, he's going to do the same. He's got such an interesting skill set, one that we've never seen before. It takes a lot of talent and mental capacity to manage that many. He's got... He's got all the tools in that toolbox. He's just figuring out how to use them. And that's what impresses me the most about Connor McDavid. He's got all the tools in the world, just knowing when to use them. In game six, he didn't have to. He might have to use them in game seven, though. We'll see. Uh, we'll get you out of here on this. First, let me say that Kobe Bryant story was a great story, and I'll get to the question now. If the Edmonton Oilers win tonight, and it feels like you're picking Florida, but if Edmonton wins, it'll be the first time a Canadian team has won the Cup since the Canadiens in 1993, you're Canadian. What would that mean to the country of Canada? Listen, Tony Wilbon, I am Canadian, but I wore that Montreal Canadiens jersey, okay? For me, that cup belongs in one city in Canada and one city only, and that's Montreal. So for me, I'm not about to wish the Stanley Cup on any Canadian team, but I will say this, as a Canadian, Traveling to Edmonton, being in that building, being around those fans, eating dinner in that city, seeing what that city is all about at this time of the year, you're damn right I'd be happy to see that cup go to Edmonton. They deserve it. They've worked really, really hard. That fan base is extremely loyal. They were tested this year. Down 3 nothing. not one person left that building. I remember watching that. I'm looking around. Not one person left that building. They've stood next to their team, as good Canadians do, so they deserve it. But the best defensive team, they're going to have to beat the best defensive team the past two years, and I think we're going to see their best performance tonight. PK, quick follow-up. I remember being with you in Toronto. You went to watch the Raptors. They represented the whole country. Yep. Is this different? I don't think so. I think I think hockey fans, they're loyal to their team, but I think a lot of Canadians are hoping that the Cup does come back home uh, to Canada. I, I think it's since 93, it's been a long time, and considering 
who's involved. I mean, Connor McDavid, you'd be hard pressed to find a soul in Canada that doesn't believe that this guy deserves a Stanley Cup. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to speak for every Canadian, but I will say this. I don't think there's anybody who's wishing anything bad on Connor McDavid. I think everybody realizes how hard this guy's worked. Three hard trophies, you know, he deserves it. He deserves this opportunity, and it would be great for the country of Canada to see him bring that thing home. I also want to see a McDavid's instead of McDonald's. I think McDonald's is going to open up a McDavid's <laughs> if he gets this thing done. You wouldn't want to see that? Come on. Well, I'm down for that, PK. PK, totally. thank you so much thank as you. always. Have fun tonight. Thank you. Know it'll be fun. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Wilbon. Bye, guys. You can, you can catch tonight's Game 7 on ABC at 8 p.m. Eastern. Let's take one last break, but still to come. Matt Scherzer returns to the mound for the first time since the World Series. And Christian Pulisic gets the United States men off to a real good start at Copa America. You know what P.K. Subban's going to be doing tomorrow morning, Wilbon? He's doing the podcast. That's starting. Happy time, people. Happy 40th birthday, J.J. Redick. Redick has been a fixture in the sports news cycle for the past three weeks, as he was first mentioned to be a coaching candidate for the Los Angeles Lakers, then was assigned to the back burner when the Lakers flirted with Danny Hurley, and then Redick finally got the Laker job last week. Redick has not coached before and has become the most intriguing and debatable coaching hire since Steve Nash. Redick was most recently in the ESPN NBA broadcast booth with Mike Green and Doris Burke. Before that, Redick was in the NBA for 15 seasons. And before that, he was the National College Player of the Year at Duke. Tony, J.J. Redick signed a free agent contract with the Chicago Bulls in 2010, which means he would have if Orlando had not matched and kept him. He would have played with a young MVP named Derrick Rose. And that might have tipped the balance in a couple of really close playoff series with LeBron. At least I, as a Bulls fan, would like to see it that way. Wish J.J. had played. Yeah, not that, you're, not that you're bitter or anything like that. Yeah, I am Happy bitter. anniversary, John Isner and Nicholas Mahout. On this day 14 years ago at Wimbledon, Isner finally broke Mahout in the 138th tiebreak game to win the longest match in tennis history. In total, it took 11 hours and five minutes over a span of three days. The last set alone took eight hours and 11 minutes. The final score was 6-4, 3-6, 6-7, 7-6, 70-68. -6, a total of 183 games. Some years later, a rule change instituted a tie break for the fifth and decisive set for men and the third and decisive set for women's singles and all doubles matches. You need a rules change. That was ridiculous. And, you know, I like organic endings. I don't know. I understand why you need a shootout penalty kicks because you can't go as long as these two dudes went. You, they needed to just have a big cane and just taking them off the court. Yeah, they get the record forever and ever. It'll never be broken. It can't be broken anymore. Right, that's right. Happy trails to Max Scherzer's absence. The Warrior God returned to the Rangers' rotation yesterday, and he looked locked in. Scherzer retired the first 13 batters he faced and 15 of 16 overall. He struck out four over five innings and got the win for a team that needs them. The champs are 37 and 40. That's four and a half games out of the final wildcard spot in the American League. One other pitching development of note yesterday, Mets closer Edwin Diaz faces a 10-day suspension after Umps ejected him from last night's win over your Cubs, Wilbon, for having improper goop on his pitching hand. Diaz claims he only uses rosin, sweat, and dirt, but the Mets did not argue the ejection. What brings these two stories together is that Scherzer got dinged for the same thing last year while he was pitching for the Mets, had to sit out. Good, I hate the Mets. Tony, those baby blue uniforms, when I, saw, when I thought they were just jerseys, I thought, this is so great. But when they pan down and show them wearing the whole uniform, can't people ever just stop themselves from going too far? Not the whole uniform, the jersey, some pale gray pants, some white pants. Hey, wake up out there. The marketing people determine that too. I'm telling you, Mike, you are the best dressed guy in the world. So you Jeez, should have authority over all of these things. Big finish. Christian Pulisic had a goal and an assist as the U.S. beat Bolivia in Copa America. Are you impressed? Yeah, kind of. Got to win that game and need to 
beat Panama. We've lost to them occasionally, but need to beat Panama on Thursday. Keep it going. The Astros swept the O's, and the Yanks <coughs> lost their third straight series. What's the bigger deal here? Three straight series, even though it's pretty against pretty good teams, Baltimore and Atlanta and Boston, but three straight is, is significant. Pretty good, yeah. Cavs are reportedly hiring Kenny Atkinson as their new head coach. Is that a good fit? Maybe so. He's got a lot of experience, a lot of places, assistant, head coach, first assistant, blah, blah, blah. But why are you firing J.B. Bickerstaff? Why'd you do that? And it still doesn't make any sense to me. Amy Yang <laughs> won the Women's PGA Championship for her first major after a long time. Your thoughts? It was her 75th try. Good for her for hanging in there. Last yes, one, Texas A&M and Tennessee. Men's College World Series tonight. Who you got, big boy? My mother's from Tennessee. I got nobody from Texas. I'm rooting for the balls. All right. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. Walker Thomas Kornheiser, happy birthday. Oh, happy birthday. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. And now your sports center. PTI. Oldest grandson. Points in a franchise record 13 assists. Reese's big performance caused a little bit of a swing in the rookie of the year odds market. Prior to this game, Reese was 10 to 1. Now she's seen that drop to plus 550. Clark, still a big favorite, but her odds lengthened significantly as well. In soccer, Christian Pulisic scoring a goal and assisted on a score as the United States cruised past Bolivia 2-0 in their Copa America opener. The U.S. improved to 6-0 at AT&T Stadium, home of the boys. The Americans next play Panama in another group stage game. That's Thursday in Atlanta. And world number one golfer Scotty Scheffler looks like it again, beating Tom Kim in a playoff to win the Travelers. He had to wait out climate protesters on the 18th green that interrupted play. But there's no stopping Scheffler, who has now earned over $27 million this year, breaking his own single season record from just last year. You take a look, because with Shepard's win, he does something that well, hasn't been done in over 50 years. That's win six tour events before the start of July. The only others since 1950 to accomplish that feat, Sam Snead and Arnold Palmer, who did it twice. Scheffler's career earning on tour now eclipses the $70 million mark. Dinner's on him. That's good for seventh most all time. The NBA draft just a couple of days away, and the most highly touted draft prospects in the world might have red, white, and blue on their flag, but they are not American. Michelle Steele has more on the French Revolution that is shaking up draft boards throughout the league. Vive la France! First, there was Wemby, Victor Wembenyama, the first Frenchman to go first overall. This year, there's been a French explosion at the top of the NBA draft. Alex Saar and Zachary Rissache could go one and two, and a third player, Tijan Salon, is projected to be a high first round pick. I think we have a lot of talent coming out of France. Every single guy that's coming out of France is like gifted, you know, uh, physically gifted, and it just shows like the amount of potential we got over there. France is the only non-U.S. country to have more than two prospects in the 2024 draft. And all five of those are within ESPN's top 50 best available players. For Will Weaver, a veteran NBA assistant and a former head coach at Paris Basketball in the country's top division, France may not be far from having the best national team in the world. I certainly don't think anybody's going to be excited to play France this summer. This incredible wellspring of talent that has bloomed in France makes them one of, if not the best teams in the world, not just in 10 years, but for the next 10 years. Helping to build a tidal wave of talent, an increasingly multicultural society where immigrants have embraced hoops, and a government that invests in training elite athletes across multiple sports, including basketball. But there are intangibles, too, when it comes to French players on the court. There's a boldness with French players, and I think the NBA saw that this year with a mild-mannered dude in Victor, who's anything but mild-mannered on the court and certainly not scared to show what makes him so special. 
The women's game has also evolved. The WNBA's Dallas Wings took Carla late ninth overall, one of two French players selected top 10. A graduate of Tony Parker Academy, a sports-centric high school in France, the 20-year-old has already been playing in the country's top women's league for a couple of years, experience that will aid her transition to the pros. I think Carla, having gone through that this past year, that will benefit her that when she arrives in the W, she'll have that quote-unquote pro experience. And then when you really take a closer look, in particular with her, you look for trend, right? She got better and better as her season went along. I spoke to Lindsay Kraft.